This is, this is sort of intimidating because I'm like looking over a thing and everybody's dark. Anyway, hi everyone, I'm Sophie Kravitz. I work for Hackaday. I'm electrical engineer and artist and pretty much interested in everything. So I've done pieces of this talk before. So some of you may have seen it here and there, but this is 70% mm, a brand new talk. So like many of you, I have a demanding day job and my day job takes up pretty much all of my time but I commit to spending between one and five hours a week on personal project time. And how many of you relate to that? Anyone here got like, okay, it'd be, it would be good if there were more of you that spent, uh, committed to spending more time on personal projects because it's really fun. But sometimes I get to spend all that time in the shop and sometimes like months go by and there's no time in the shop. But I've been working on this project, which is a blimp obstacle course, for two years this week at about, you know, at about an hour at a time. So I hope that this persuades some of you who are like, I don't have time to work on a project that you can accomplish things in two years. So I'm starting off with a really dramatic picture. Did I just lose? No. Blimps are sometimes called zeppelins and sometimes they're called airships little bit of history here in World War I and World War II, airships, which are rigid on all sides, were used to carry passengers. And I'm showing this picture here of the Hindenburg blimp, which was filled with hydrogen and exploded very famously, I think in 1938. And 36 people were killed. And after that, nobody used uh, any sort of airship to carry passengers around. And I think we can imagine why. But the kind of blimp that I made, it's a mini blimp. Kind of looks like, well, doesn't really look like that, but essentially my mini blimp is a balloon powered by pager motors. And yeah, you wouldn't think that something like that would be hard. I, I didn't, I thought I'd be done in a few weeks. But it turns out that making something that flies has a lot of gotchas. Making something that communicates wirelessly has a lot of gotchas. And then like the biggest gotcha, I think is making something reliable. And we've heard a few talks uh, probably yesterday and this morning about making something that's a product Making a product requires that it's reliable, and that has been the hardest thing for me entirely. So speaking about productizing, uh, for helium gets a, a really bad rap with the shortages, and so for me to productize this, and throughout this process, I'm now talking to two companies about they want to productize it and sort of have me as their lead engineer guide or whatever. The helium problems make this hard to productize. That's what I keep hearing. Party City's shares just went down 30% over bad press, just to give you an idea. And I think that helium's a really interesting material, so I thought I would just, we're pretty nerdy here, so I thought you guys wouldn't mind if we spent like three or four slides talking about some nerdy stuff. So it's one, of, um, it's one of the noble gas groups on the periodic table, and what that means is that they're inert. And so basically inert gas, if you just look it up, it means it doesn't react at all. And I was looking for what is a good analogy, because what does that mean, that it doesn't react? So one of the things that inert gases, primarily argon, sometimes mixed with helium, is used for is in welding. And if you've never welded before, there's an electrode and a pool of metal, and these two things need to stick together. The analogy is soldering. If it oxidizes, meaning oxygen attaching itself to the surface, it won't work. Um, how many of you have had soldering tips that just don't work? Yeah, pretty much everybody. So that's why. It's because it's reacting with oxygen. And so in welding, uh, for TIG welding and MIG welding, they put a gas through the electrode, and that's what makes that work. And helium has a lot of the same properties that argon does. This is just a really cool picture. Helium <laughs> is, this is, uh, this is at CERN. This is the Large Hadron Collider, or sometimes it's called the particle, particle Accelerator. And this is one of the things that helium is most used in, a, it, in scientific equipment and MRI machines. And it's used to cool uh, like semiconductor magnets. And there's been a lot of alarm stories about the world's helium supplies. But honestly, like for me, researching on, 
on Google, it's really hard to get a clear indication of what's really going on. So this one, this opinion piece by Tim Worstel, he is a really well-known libertarian, and he's basically making fun of the helium shortages. This is Hackaday, 2016, in Tanzania. This article is about uh, a field that was just helium that was discovered in Tanzania that has about seven years' worth of the helium, world helium supply. And then this one is, I think, the most recent story that I could find, and here's where I found this little thing about Party City seeing its share price tank 30% in six months based on this. So even though I find it really hard to piece together all the information, it seems to me that we have about 15 years left. So there's eight years worth of helium that comes from the where the most of the supply comes from in Amarillo, Texas, and there's this seven-year supply or eight-year supply that was found in Tanzania. And to give an idea of how much we use, it's the spec is 6.2 billion cubic feet, but that's equivalent to 10,000 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade balloons, which I think is easier to visualize than cubic feet. So whether or not there's a helium shortage currently, yes, that slide's meant to be bank, uh, blank. Um, I think it's interesting and important to know the origin of materials in general. We, you know, as We've been experiencing a lot of environmental change and our use of raw material directly contributes. And as I've been developing this project and as there's been more stuff in the news about climate change, I've been thinking a lot about the idea that as designers and engineers we should be, and you know, we certainly have the skills to be, thinking about the end of life processes and choosing the materials that we use for the products that we design before we design them. And I didn't put this up because this feels a little preachy to me, and I don't mean it that way. So anyway, I mean now I'm going to talk about my fun project. Um, so the Blimp Obstacle Course currently is called Kitty in all capitals because they're cat blimps. We all love cats. And it came about because initially I was just like, oh, I want to make something that flies. And uh, drones are, I saw this video Okay, it's like sad, but I saw a video of someone in Long Island, New York, who practically got their head sliced off, and that was, that was it. I'm scarred for life. I don't ever want to have anything to do with a drone. So I decided to make a blimp. And the concept, it's a multiplayer indoor blimp obstacle course, and there's a story. It's about sacrifice, shape-changing, and revenge. Cat blimps have names. They're called Poppy, Shrinky, Donna, and La Floaty, and they live on Proper Popper, which is a fictional planet. A lot of my work has a narrative that goes through it, so this is the narrative. Um, their mission is to stay alive as possible. They want to beat out the other blimps for points, and they don't want to get popped. So you drive these blimps around an indoor space like this one, and there's hoops hanging from a ceiling, and I'll show you some pictures later. Every time these blimps go through a hoop, they can either get a lot of points, or they can lose their lives, because the, him the hoops have ha actuated pins on them that might pop you as you go through. And there's some sound effects and a leaderboard and like it's a whole production. A lot of my projects have a whole production that goes along with it, which is why it's not here. It's a little too much to travel around with. So this project, I just showed it off for the first time in real life um, just in April. So all this time went by, almost two years, and I finally showed it off at my hackerspace in New York, NYC Resistor, we have an interactive show every year, and I brought it there. And it was pretty cool. I put ears on it and a tail, and people were driving it around the room and bringing it up to groups of people, like, like people were standing in groups, and there would be the blimp right there. And it's so funny when you put personality stuff onto a balloon. I swear to God, people were like petting it and like patting it and like pushing it across the room. It was, it was very cool to see how people interacted with this project. I wish I had play tested it a lot sooner. So when I started designing this thing, I, because there's so many pieces, I had to pick something as a constraint. And um, you know, it could have been, I could have been really anything. But I decided to choose the hoop. I own this hoop. It's about three meters in diameter. And the best thing about it is that it fits in a car and in a box, and it doesn't cost extra to take on a
Like it's just about the right size, under the size of getting it onto a plane. So the blimp itself, the, the envelope, needs to be a little bit less than that. Pictured here is my friend Shei Wei Wang. He works at Pratt. He designed with his students a CNC machine for making inflatables. So the way that this thing works is you put your two layers of whatever it is, polyester film or plastic or whatever blimp material or, or inflatable material, and it goes around and cuts it out, and then you flip the head over and it goes around and seals the edge. It's pretty ingenious. But this is about a year in, and I'm visiting and I'm watching this thing, and they're like, you know, like how a 3D printer, how you have to like mess around with it all the time? Well, you have to mess around with this all the time. And I'm like, oh, so now I'm gonna have like this eight foot thing and I'm gonna be messing around with it, making blimps, and I'm never gonna be done with this project. So I decided that I would buy a blimp. <laughs> so this is the size of the blimp that I ended up purchasing. It's two feet in diameter and goes through, sorry, the blimp, uh, the hoop diameter is one meter, so this is just under a half meter. I thought that this balloon, since I was buying it online, like basically just, you know, putting in like five things and pay now, that it would be available forever. And right before April, when I was exhibiting it at my hackerspace, the company is like going out of business. And I had popped all the blimps trying to shove more helium into it, like the five that I had for two years. So the first thing I did was tried to make my own. And I made like, this is the eighth one. I spent an entire day, maybe like 14 hours, just cutting mylar and uh, using like a little tiny iron like that to make a blimp. Um, it wasn't that successful. Like, it's just really, you know, it's like another manufacturing process that is hard. So I found this, the, the company that is in a, a different country and in a very remote place, I found their number online and I called them and left a message. And basically their outgoing message was like, oh, we're not here and we won't be here for two more months. So I left a message and then I get a text maybe three days later. At this point I've forgotten about it and I'm like, I have to find another solution. So I get a text and the person is like, I'm trying to retire and I have these balloons, but I don't have a way to sell it to you because we don't have an automated system anymore and we're closing up shop. So now, okay, so now they've given me a phone number. So I call up like immediately. And I'm like, hey, you guys are the people that inspired me to make my blimp. And we end up, we're still texting. We've been texting for, since April. Um, he sent me blimps. They arrived yesterday in New York and I'm here, so. But it's been pretty interesting talking to this person and meeting other people in the blimp community. Did anyone know there was a blimp community? <laughs> well, there is a blimp community. There's probably like 20 people in it, and I know all of them. And they've all sort of found this project online and reached out for various reasons. It's, it's, it's weird and touching at the same time. So. One of the things about helium that's pretty cool, it's equivalent to a gram lift. So coming back to the, the size that this one, that I was designing it around, and it's currently designed around, I used this to kind of figure out how much lift I would need. I tested it empirically, like I filled it up with helium and measured how much it would lift, but helium changes, the properties change depending on your altitude and the temperature in the room. And so I just wanted to know I don't know, I'm into math. I wanted to know, what's the number? So I approximated the size of the cylinder, um, got like 16 thousandths of cubic meters, and this is how much, the thousand liters of helium, and that is equivalent to 16 grams of lift. So in addition to my one meter diameter hoop, I now had another constraint. The blimp itself, the balloon, and the helium needed to be able to lift up no more than 16 grams, and this became I mean, this became like a really hard problem because 16 grams is, that's how much 16 grams is. And, and these, are, these are electronics. And electronics, it turns out electronics are kind of heavy. I don't have any cameras or anything, but just PCB is heavy. I went through an embarrassing number of revs. 
I'm currently at a place where I finished what I would call version one. I have something that flies and works and works pretty reliably. But I went through at least seven revs. I mean, I was just, I, I have to say thank you to Osh Park because they paid for all of these. So thank you, Osh Park, wherever you are, if you're in this room. Um, and after a while, it just became like, I always have something in, in design. Like, I've always got something. I've got something coming now uh, from Osh Park for this project. So just a little bit about the design. This is way back in 2017 when I first, sta when I first started. One of the things to save weight, and I think if you're trying to save weight on any kind of toy or commercial product, is where you put the battery charging. And so I think we've all seen things where the battery charger is off to the side. You have to buy a battery charger, potentially lose it or whatever. Or you design it right into the board. I designed mine right into the board, but only because I really hate those JST connectors. Ah, oh, here, I, how many people relate to that? Yeah, everybody. Yeah, they suck. Why do they not design something different? Like, I, I don't understand. Every time I use one of these things, I pull out the wires, I squeeze the thing, it shorts out, I don't know, it's, it's really a big problem. So I decided that I would not have that in the board. Usually when, I when I'm designing something, my process is to have a top page with sort of all the modules so that I can just look at the top page or send it to someone so that I, we can discuss it by module and then all the subsequent pages b below it. Most of this fit onto one page. I think this, the whole schematic is three pages, but these are the four major parts of this project. So I had a power supply. Um, my version one uses ESP8266, so it communicates over Wi-Fi, and a battery charging circuit, like I just mentioned, to get away from the, uh, the <laughs> to get away from the JST connector, and motor drivers. When I first started this thing, I never worked with uh, brushed motors. Brushed motors are pager motors, and they're cheap. And I went with a four millimeter diameter motor, and I didn't, I didn't know anything about them. Like these come with, the only spec they come with is RPM and like how big they are, their diameter and length. I ordered 11 different kinds from Amazon, and that's where they all, that's where I'm buying them from right now because I don't want to have thousands of these things from Alibaba. But I have settled on a motor that works and it's 57,000 RPMs, which seems crazy, and 3.7 volts. This was my first rev. I think this was a year in. And so I threw everything, like you can see the ESP isn't connected, the propellers aren't connected. I just threw everything on the scale to see where I was at. And I was, I mean, this was pretty good. I'm like, oh, I just need to save four grams a year later. Um, I, I got pretty close, I'm like three off here. And so you can see this header in the middle, this is the programming header, and if anyone here has ever used the Tag Connect cable, how many people here, Tag Connect? Okay, so I see only three, so I'll tell you what a Tag Connect is, because it really changed my life. Tag Connect is that little, you can see the cable, it's got the, uh, a programming end, and Pogo pins, so it means like it, it pushes against your footprint, which is the size of an 0805, and programs your chips. You don't need to solder in a header, you don't need to buy a header. The cable is pretty expensive, like I think it was $60, but I don't ever have to buy headers or use headers ever again, which is amazing. And I actually have two different tag connects now for different protocols, because I love it so much. So this was uh, the first flight in October of 2018, and I had a ton of problems, like a ton of problems. The m propellers were spinning, they didn't spin fast enough. The e ESP8266, it kept losing connection. And, you know, it was three or four grams overweight. It was the one that was 19.1 grams, and I thought, oh, I'll just try and see what happens. But this is actually what was needed. So I think this is like <laughs> my one funny slide because everybody can probably relate to this. I had, I had so many gotchas. By the time I was about a year in, a year and three months or something, I had redesigned the power supply. I'd redesigned the motor drivers. My power layout pretty much sucked. Like I used a star layout, but 
it wasn't working. And I was afraid to do too many ground pours or ground pours or power pours because I was trying to save weight. So I was doing this thing where I had like a little circle of pour over here and then a little circle of pour over there. And what was happening was the power was really unreliable and ESPs, they, when they connect to Wi-Fi, they, it's like 1.7 amps. So every time they did that, my power supply would drop out and Weirdly, I was able to fix this by re doing a different layout, like laying it out properly with the proper pores and in the proper configuration and not trying to save weight and also throwing capacitors all over the place, which, you know, that's, that's the way that you solve those problems. I also had a lot of soldering issues. I've now, two years later, I just ordered my first boards from Seed Studio that are assembled and we'll see how that they should be there next week. We'll see how that works out. But my power supply chip is a QFN and it's very small and it took me a really long time to figure out how to solder that by hand. Now I own a microscope, I own a hot air gun. Um, I'm really good at soldering QFNs but please do not ask me to do that. <laughs> but even though I spent a lot of time soldering. I got to watch this whole season of this TV show I like. <laughs> it was amazing. This is the, the first controller housing. So a little bit about um, user, user interface design in the sense of controllers. I like to make my controllers, I've had a lot of different sort of game controllers or art piece controllers sort of match the world that they're, they're in. So the world of proper popper is curvy, it's a fantasy world. So this was designed like this. And even though all gaming controllers have joysticks and buttons, the thought that went into this is, I want people to pick up whatever the controller is and know what to do with it. And I think everybody, children included, know that a joystick moves the speed. Something's gonna move if you move a joystick. And something's gonna happen if you push a button. And so when I exhibit the, exhibited this two months ago, I just left the joystick like on a pedestal and the blimp was floating around the room. Everybody knew what to do. No one was like, oh, can I touch this? Everyone's like, oh, game controller, let me, let me add it. Inside of this controller is an Adafruit feather and that's using an ESP32 and I'm just gonna complain for a second. So ESP32 <laughs> connects fine over Wi-Fi to ESP8266, but it has this weird spec which is like, so many analog to digital converters. Like it says something, I don't remember, like 28, but it, they don't work with Wi-Fi, which is like, yeah, analog, the analog digital converter one, which only has two, works with Wi-Fi. And then all the others, the one that are in the spec, like look at us, we have 24 ADCs, doesn't work with Wi-Fi. And the, uh, I needed the ADCs. This one was an on-off controller. And when I redesigned the motor drivers, I went to proportional control. So this is what I've got right now. And it's not as cute as the red button joystick, but the proportional control works a, a really a lot better. So I'm the first version of this did use Wi-Fi, and I went with that because the ESPs have a community around them, and I could program them in Arduino. I think it saved, it saved this project. I would not have been able to do it had I started with Bluetooth or BLE and like if you go way back in like my Twitter or even on the Arduino, if you search under Sophie on Arduino forums, it's like I'm begging for help all over the place in the beginning. But there's a community and they're pretty nice and so this helped me to get the communication system running. But I just started laying out a, or I just had a 900 megahertz board made. So that's what's going for the next version. I'm using a module that's by Hope RF, and if I can remember, RFM 89 HCW. Wow, okay, that, that's what I'm using. And fun fact, you know, 900 megahertz was used for uh, cordless phones back in the day. So, Eventually, this is, this is the final version, the one that flies, so it's well under 16 grams. The ears add another gram and a half though, so kind of back up there. But where I'm at right now is it flies and it's, it controls extremely well. I'm gonna 
show kind of an old video here. That's my husband who puts up with all of this stuff, hula hoops in the living room. So this thing where it's spinning like that, that doesn't happen anymore. With the proportional control, I was able to get rid of that. So I'm just looking forward to seeing how the 900 megahertz thing works out. I'm talking to two companies. Maybe I'll productize it, maybe not. I'm not really sure. I have a vision more of a art piece where there's a lot of these things where all of you could drive them around and control them and play, play them through the hoops because it is pretty fun. Um, the project is under my Hackaday IO profile, so you can go there if you want to look at it. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, got time for one or two questions really quick. Questions? There we go. Does your blimp just have uh, one chamber in it for air? I know like the big, huge Goodyear blimp has like front and back chambers, and is that something you plan to do? So the blimp that I'm buying has it doesn't have chambers like what you're talking about, but the way it's made is like one big chamber, and then inside of it, there's sort of a blimp underwear, if you will, to stop the helium from coming back out. So there's a mini oh, cool. blimp inside of it. And so if I start making mine myself, yeah, I, I think I will do that. Cool, thank you. One more? Can you tell us about your worst or funniest blimp accident? Oh, now you're putting me on the spot. There's, uh, there's quite a lot. I think just when I was showing it in April, so what the, okay, I didn't tell this part of the story, but I had popped all the blimps. I was unsuccessful making my own blimp, so I ended up putting two clear blimp balloons together. Um, that were kind of a, a hamburger shape also, with the ears and the tail and that whole thing, like the whole thing was, it was quite big. And that was what was driving around the room, talking to people. <laughs> I don't bring them outside anymore. <laughs> um, so the saucer shape of your blimp, have you, do, did you solve the spin problem by moving away from the saucer shape like to a, a more dirigible type thing with fins or did you solve it in uh, software control? Two things, I solved it mostly in software control just by not allowing it to, like if you go left or right in software there's delays built in. But also, I extended the arm out a little bit to change the center of balance. Uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you, Sophie.